Kia ora koutou and welcome to this evening's webinar, No Pegasus Health Aho, No Ototahi Aho, Ko Mariburg Toku Inua, No Rera Tenakoto 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 Katoa. Thank you for joining this webinar on the general practice monitoring and management of mild to moderate COVID-19 illness learnings from Canada. We have with us this evening our presenter, Professor Dr. Dee Mangin, who is going to talk to us about her experiences uh, managing COVID-19 in Canada. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Professor Dee Mangin, who is going to talk to us about her experience of uh, dealing with COVID-19 illness in Canada. Thanks, Marie, and kia ora katoa, everybody. It's so nice to see so many um, friends and familiar names in the uh, in the participant list. Um, so what I'm going to share with you is my experience um, as medical uh, lead for our family health team COVID management, um, where we looked over after over 500 uh, COVID positive patients in primary care, and also as medical lead, uh, lead for um, for that model as we scaled it across Ontario. And the hope really is that I could just share what we've learned and share resources and, and feel free to use these and adapt them in any way that you think might be helpful um, in your practice and just getting ready for, for that time um, where you might have to manage mild to moderate COVID illness in primary care. Um, all the slides will be available after the session. Um, and uh, uh, also help um, able to answer questions if you want to email me afterwards as well. So I'm, I'm sharing with you a very strange and unusual journey for um, the last year, and, and this is our journey in Canada. So you can see that um, we had a very small blip as our first wave, and much larger blips as our second and, and third waves. And in our third wave, we were seeing over 4,000 new cases a day in Ontario. So the hospital systems were very much um, overwhelmed at that point. And it was at this point in the second wave that we realised that the um, boutique systems that had been put in place to manage uh, COVID-19, while fine for small numbers, were not working. Uh, patients were falling through the cracks and weren't um, getting good care. So the existing systems weren't working and we initiated this primary care-led model then. Why primary care? Well, because as we all know, the outcomes are always better for populations when primary care systems are the strongest, and it's no different for COVID-19 illness. And because COVID is largely a mild to moderate infectious disease, and this is bread and butter for primary care. It's not rocket science. Um, 90% is managed out of hospital, doesn't need admission. Um, it is a new illness and it's very infectious and it can deteriorate rapidly, but it is a viral community acquired largely pneumonia type illness. And the other reason why for primary care is, is that as with the earthquakes in Christchurch, relationship-based primary care matters even more in disaster and crisis. Both our knowledge of the patient, that generalist approach that's our superpower, because it's not just the COVID illness, it's the other, the um, psychological and physical illnesses in, in those patients which are at higher risk of serious illness. They also have multimorbidity and often um, mental health problems that go along with them that we know um, well. So these need to be managed as well. Our, our knowledge of the patient and also don't underestimate the therapeutic power of storytelling and trust. So that familiarity of the practice team in unfamiliar times, it's a really scary moment when a patient receives a COVID-19 positive diagnosis and especially if they're high risk because patients know if they're in that group that are at risk of more serious illness. So that familiarity of the trusted team is so important. I have no data to support it, but I'm sure it helps a lot with the psychological aspect impact of COVID-19 illness. And also in that key piece of what I think is effective care, which is the consideration by the professional or patient of the best that medical science has to offer. And we could see this piece of care starting to go awry um, when case numbers got high with desperate clinicians um, really stepping outside their rational approach to, to evidence and starting to actually think about experimenting on patients with unproven treatments like hydroxychloroquine. So it's really important for us to have a good grasp of the evidence because patients will have heard about these things on social media too. And to keep to that, that approach to care that we know works, which is evidence-based relationship, um, person-focused primary care. Why now? Because of Delta, 
and because border opening must happen at some point. So hopefully New Zealand has dodged the bullet with this outbreak, but it's at some point, even if everybody is fully vaccinated, we will still have to deal with mild to moderate COVID illness in the, in the community. Just to talk about a little bit of a big, the big picture of context before we get into the weeds of that exactly how to manage your COVID positive patients, the contextual factors that we experienced and you will too as the case number dries are fear and uncertainty um, and media reporting of worst case outcomes that we and patients both see and it skews your view of the illness. We certainly at the outset were afraid to go to work for the first time. I was afraid when I went to work because I really didn't know as much as we do now about how it was transmitted. And there's a sense of urgency and panic that, that overtakes even the non-urgent uh, communications and aspects of care. So it's important to try and, and um, keep that under, under control. And then that pressure that we experienced of reduced non-COVID services as well leaves with a feeling of, of kind of overload. So having a clear pathway for our COVID positive patients and knowing exactly what to do step by step is really important. The other things that we learned that I want to share with you is that new technology platforms as the solution are not a solution. Developing new models of care rather than leveraging the known effective um, existing systems was inefficient, chaotic, and not scalable. And that centralized specialist care is not necessarily the best model just because it's a special illness. And that leaving primary care out of both planning and care models at the beginning was a mistake. The other thing we learned and we try very hard with this model to avoid is that getting COVID positive patients um, to congregate settings for healthcare is very high risk, especially um, with Delta. We had an outbreak uh, in an oncology ward and that was a, a disaster. And we know now from data from lots of different countries that up to 20% of cases actually can be iatrogenic transmission. Um, so the key lesson was primary care must take the initiative and we need to have the confidence and clinical courage to do so. We are treading an unknown territory, but we do have evidence to guide us. So our primary care model that we developed, um, first in our family health team and then scaled across the pro uh, province, had three key elements. It was a systematic approach to patient risk assessment to decide who that we needed to monitor more closely. And then an evidence-supported clinical pathway and template for our EMRs for that monitoring and, and follow-up. And then a supply of pulse oximeters that we could lend to those high-risk patients to really help monitor the illness. And that, that was really key. So what ventilators are to hospital care of COVID, pulse oximeters are to primary care of COVID. And those, those, um, that pathway is available there in the, in the link that I, that I have um, pasted there in the slide. And that's free and, and open access. So we planned for three phases of illness. The first, when there was capacity to manage all hypoxic patients in hospital, those who needed oxygen could go to hospital to get it. We planned for two other phases. So the first was when hospital, the second was when hospital capacity was overwhelmed and we took early step down patients. They were past their acute phase. We knew they weren't going to need ventilating, but they were still going to need oxygen, anticoagulants and steroids for a couple of weeks. And so we would take them and, and look after them in the community. And we did reach that stage. The third stage, which we never reach, was um, if the hospital system was completely overwhelmed and you actually have to initiate acute oxygen treatment in the community, and that's very high risk. Um, and hopefully you or and we will never get to that stage. Um, so the goals of this model are to detect and transfer to hospitals early as possible those who need support with oxygen, because there's really good evidence that the earlier you can detect the hypoxic patient and start oxygen, the better the outcome. And we know that that um, silent hypoxia is also a, a, a predictor for poorer outcomes. And to maintain hospital capacity and reduce nosocomial infection by managing the patients in their own homes who we could, who didn't need oxygen support. Um, excellent primary care doesn't have to be elaborate. It is the same care that we always provide. It's a doctor and a patient or a nurse or a nurse practitioner and a patient who know each other um, and a way of communicating. And in fact, many of our consultations weren't even done by video. They were done over the telephone. So there's no need to provide in-person care. Physical exam really, if ever, adds anything um, to, to your management decisions. And, and in particular, the key decision, which is, does this patient need to go to hospital or not? And really, the key defining thing, um, once your cases get up, the only patients you'll be able to cope with in hospital is those who need oxygen. And all others will have to be managed in the community. So with, with a pulse oximeter, which really helps concretely identify those patients who need transfer. So the setting is in all phases. The patient was at home 
with a pulse oximeter if they were um, in that high risk category. And the primary care team provided monitoring remotely to all these active patients. In our clinic, we called it the COVID ward round. So the time each day that we set aside for those consultations with our active COVID patients. The support, and as I talked about before, were these care pathways with open access on the HFAM website, and we update them real time as new evidence um, uh, comes out in the, in the literature and those supporting temp apps and pulse oximeters to make it really cognitively easy in a time of cognitive overload, which I know you've all already experienced. The pulse oximeters, so um, these were held uh, at the practice level. That we, From the ministry in Ontario, we distributed 15,000 pulse oximeters to practices, and each practice established what worked in their local area for timely supply to patients and for collection and then recycling. So generally it was friends and family pick up, for people who didn't have to be um, in isolation. They would often do a, a sort of contact through, through drive-through or just a, a brief stop in to pick those up. Or if that was unavailable, staff drop-off, we knew all our staff's um, routes home um, to and from the clinic. Or failing that, um, and in much more rare instances, volunteer, a volunteer pick stop. We had a group of volunteers who were more than happy to drop off in, in people's letterboxes. Um, we also had you know, paramedics and people like that offered to help us out too if we if we really got stuck, but we never had to had to use that. In terms of the numbers, we found that two pulse oximeters per thousand enrolled patients was more than enough, even at the case rates we had, because not all patients are in their active monitoring period at the same time. They're only in active monitoring for 14 days and only a proportion need the pulse oximeters. And I'll talk about the, the proportions um, in a minute. Um, and we, we provided patients with both paper and web-based instructions for using um, the pulse oximeters that we, we, the paper ones we supplied when we supplied the pulse ox, and also a video for how to use a, a pulse ox. Um, so now into the weeds, which I know is what you really want to know the most, is what do I do when I get a COVID positive result for a patient in my inbox and I'm managing them in primary care? So, um, and you feel free to follow along on the pathway if you'd like to. So um, I'm just going to take you through these. These are the key pieces of the pathway that you need to be able to provide care for that COVID positive uh, patient, the monitoring and follow up, and then the, the specific detail of how you go about management. Um, and I have the picture there of Casey Irvin, who's our Mission Impossible um, website provider. So he was the he was the person who real time would would update the evidence and information, usually late on a Sunday night. For us. So I always acknowledge um, his work and efforts in this slide because really the look of this website is is all down to Casey. Um, so what does this patient need? The first thing when you get that positive result is to risk stratify the patient, and this is the template that we used for that. So you can see we divided patients into three groups of high risk average risk and low risk. And you'll all be familiar with what makes a patient high risk. So anyone over the age of 60 automatically is high risk and we hover over them with daily monitoring for 14 days. Patients of any age with a medical comorbidity, and we didn't specify those comorbidities that were in or out because the data from the studies while it does identify some comorbidities that seem to make people at higher risk, in those studies, they tended to re restrict them, their analysis to only, say, a range of 20 comorbidities um, rather than looking at, at everything. And so we were confident with that to say that, no, this comorbidity doesn't make you at high risk. So really anything that was a comorbidity or a, or a risk factor that required medicating like hypertension automatically put that patient in the high risk group. And there's also social safety net flags down the bottom here, which also made us um, pop that patient in the high risk group and keep a closer eye on them. Average risk, and that you'll see these two groups are the ones that we supplied pulse oximeters to. Any pregnant woman um, that um, um, we, we, we started with, um, not necessarily giving them pulse oximeters, but as the evidence emerged that they tended to do was we really gave every pregnant woman a pulse oximeter to monitor and hovered over them, not every day, but every two days at least. And then those in the 40 to 6 year old age group with no medical comorbidities, they're at sort of average risk, but if we had, if we were concerned about them, then we would supply them with a pulse oximeter. This low risk group of healthy adults, young adults, no comorbidities, no safety net flags, um, you can consider self-monitoring only. You don't necessarily need to monitor them. You do that first consultation where you provide some extensive education, the red flags, the when to call you, and the education about the, the, like, the illness trajectory, that, that potential for drop-off, um, the cliff at, at a week, um, and, and how to manage, self-manage at home. 
but then they can self-monitor and just contact you if they need to. The key thing I want to flag is that so people say, well, how are you going to know about these young adults who are getting who are getting really sick? Any patient in this group who develops increasing symptoms, so symptom deterioration, automatically becomes high risk and gets a pulse oximeter. Um, so the monitoring template, what are you going to monitor? Again, it's it's very straightforward. Um, it's how does the patient feel? What are their symptoms today? In particular, do they have dyspnea or not? And key, change is your friend. Is it worse than yesterday or is it stable? So you're really looking for change in all of these things. How are their vital signs? And are they stable or are they changed from yesterday? And do they have any comorbidities or other medications that need um, managing? So they, those are the key groupings. And then checking for those usual red flag symptoms. And they're really the same red flag symptoms that we would always check for with a community-acquired pneumonia, say, that would always trigger us to admit the patient for, to hospital. So, so um, uh, respiratory signs of respiratory distress um, and uh, other signs of just general shutdown and dehydration. Um, so the second section is management, and I'm going to talk a little in a, a little bit more detail uh, about this. Um, so there are really five key areas for management. The first is setting the patient expectations. This is not an, a short viral illness. This tends to be a protracted course, more like influenza, and patients get quite crook. They're really quite sick, um, even if they're not hypoxic enough to go to hospital. Um, and we have a PDF there linked um, that's got um, a, a, a detail about what they can expect, what kind of symptoms, and at which phases in the illness. Um, so for educating the patient. Rest is really important because fatigue is often a marker for hypoxia. And so getting the patient to listen to their body, if they feel fatigued or tired, then they shouldn't push themselves. Breathing. Um, there's no evidence for primary care for prone lying or changing in breathing positions. There is evidence for those hospitalised patients that prone lying and, and changing breathing posi um, positions decreases the mechanical work of breathing. But it, it seemed to make sense to us to trial this. And in fact, patients reported back to us that it did ease their symptoms of dyspnea. And we got a few patients to monitor with their pulse oxes. And the, particularly the prone position did seem to, to improve their sets a little bit. And it's probably because of the prone position, the mechanical work of breathing breathing is less. He, of course, is the safety net. Who are they going to call and with which, with which symptoms? When are they going to call you? Um, and important to educate your front reception staff as part of your team that if one of your monitored patients called, they need calls out of, you know, outside their normal check-in time, they need to be put through, right through to one of the clinical staff um, because we know that deterioration can happen um, fairly over within 24 hours. But who are they going to call and when? Hydration, really important to, um, as what you always do with viral illness, ensure adequate hydration um, and to um, reinforce the instructions which will come from public health on how to isolate. And also we've got some instructions there for family members, how to care for someone with COVID and keep them isolated within the household. Now, there's also on the website, there's a PDF that rolls all of this patient advice into a PDF with these PDFs of instructions for breathing and what to expect from the illness. Um, and if you click there, and I know it's going to be customised for the local New Zealand setting, but um, we would click there and that can be emailed out to the patient as well to reinforce what you say to them in that first consultation. Um, so just going through medication treatment. So treatment, just don't, mostly. And you'll find on the website here, mostly the evidence for what not to give. And that's really important to have that evidence at our fingertips because patients come in having read all kinds of things about all kinds of weird and wonderful treatments on social media. And so it's really important for us to be able to calmly reassure them in our usual way that the evidence doesn't support this. In fact, the evidence clearly indicates that most of these are of no benefit. You know, but, or in some cases harm. Um, I just want to flag there is a recent a large study and you can look at our analysis of it if you go to the web, uh, website. All of these things are live links to the actual evidence um, that in um, patients who are at high risk of serious illness, there does seem to be some shortening of the symptom duration um, if started early in the illness. Um, there's no, it doesn't seem to be any effect on um, hospital admissions or some more serious illness, but it's worthwhile thinking about in those high risk patients that match the trial group. There's no evidence to support this in younger asymptomatic or non high risk patients, and we really don't know. These were largely unvaccinated. We don't know really whether it's going to be worthwhile in our vaccinated. Um, comfort medications, 
um, choose paracetamol, not because there's anything special about paracetamol and COVID. There was a bit of a sort of stir about that at the beginning of the illness, but because generally in viral illness, anti-inflammatories increase your risk of cardiovascular events, even with a few days of use. And of our patients who are more at risk of serious illness, they are also the ones that are more at risk of cardiovascular events. So if paracetamol will manage their um, their viral illness symptoms and keep them comfortable, that's preferable to using anti-inflammatories. That doesn't mean you can't use NSAIDs, but just, just the, the, the priority order would be to use paracetamol first. For existing medications, it's business as usual. You'll all probably know now that the evidence really supports continuing things like ACEs and ARVs, which there were question marks over at the beginning, that we should continue medications for COPD and asthma as always. They don't seem to have any effect particularly uh, or any worsening of the illness. Um, but the one thing to think about is, is the sad man's medications. So if uh, the patient is at risk of dehydration either because of their fever or you're worried about their intake or output or they have diarrhea as part of their sy symptom cluster, especially if it's four or more times a day. Think of acute kidney injury risk because it is, in those who have more serious illness, um, AKI is quite a prominent feature um, of, of the significant morbidity. And so if we can think of those medications like ACEs, ARBs, diuretics that we might need to pause for a few days, that's a really important that we can make in managing their other um, medications and, and morbidities. Also, if they have diabetes, just keep a closer eye, get them to monitor their sugars more often. We find that the COVID seems to, to make the sugars go out of whack. And in a few patients, actually, they develop diabetes as part of their um, COVID illness, those with more serious illness. Immunosuppressants, check with the, the relevant specialists. In some cases, they may need pausing if it's not going to upset the apple cart or whatever condition they're controlling. But if the risk of... of um, letting their um, uh, illness for which they're taking immunosuppressants, if the, the risk of that getting out of control is too great, then they are continued. So that's very much a, a boutique individual approach. Um, just to flag a little bit, we also have a pathway down the bottom here that we developed for palliative care for, for COVID. So one of our goals was to be able to avoid those cruel situations where older adults, frail older adults, were dying in hospitals separated from their family. And so we did provide a pathway for providing oxygen and care in the home to patients where escalation of care and ventilation wasn't going to improve their outcomes and when they and the family really wished to remain at home. And so we've just got a brief section on, on what the goals are for oxygenation. You should aim for SATs between 92 and 96 because that's the sweet spot. Any higher and they do worse and any lower and they do worse. Um, when to refer to ED, so what are the red flags? Um, and you'll find with this routine regular monitoring, you will be able to detect this as it happens. Um, you know, that, that it won't come as a surprise to you, that sudden drop off, because you will have those baselines and you'll be able to see um, really easily when the, when the patient is deteriorating. So it's the same reason, same things that we would always admit a patient with significant pneumonia to hospital for. They're getting significantly tech tachycardic or is tachypneic, if their um, pulse ox reading is, is consistently less than or equal to 92%. And so we would always, if they had a low reading one off, we would always get them to check it again, warm the hand, make sure that, that it is a true reading, but that would trigger hospital admission. And if they're um, a tachypneic, also, if, they, um, if they're breathless despite normal oxygen sat, so you often see that in younger people, they're working too hard to maintain their normal fat, so that shows that they're about to drop off the cliff and decompensate, or just in, really they're finding a huge mechanical difficulty in the work of, of breathing. Other things that would always get us to send, send a patient to, to um, A&E, pain or pressure in the chest, shut down, um, dehydration, needing IV fluids and, and general change in level of consciousness, cyanosis popping up, but all of these things would always trigger us to send a patient to hospital anyway. So there's nothing um, super new about those red flags. Um, just to show you uh, the PDF of what we send to patients. So, um, and you can feel free to take this, adapt it and use it in whatever way you might find helpful. And I know there'll be New Zealand templates being made as well, almost as we speak. So the red flags and who to call if, with what, the illness um, course expectations and, and those advice about rest, breathing positions. And we've got a lovely little diagram with different silhouettes of the different uh, positions, how to use a pulse oximeter. And in our how to use, we've got the criteria for when to call the clinic, which are the same as, as when we would admit to hospital, which is the SATs are 92 or less, 
or if we no, if we noticed a change of 3% or more from baseline. And that's really important because, as we all know, some patients who perhaps have um, uh, COPD might have lower baseline SATs. And so because we're monitoring from the first positive result, so when they're still relatively well, we've got that baseline. And so that change of 3% from baseline is the trigger in those patients that they're falling off the cliff and they need to be transferred for, um, to hospital for oxygenation and, and closer monitoring. Um, there is some talk about, uh, and there was one study that showed that pulse oximeters aren't as accurate in, in um, uh, people who are uh, black. There's no studies that, uh, that um, cover Maori and Pacific Island. But in fact, when you look at that study, it wasn't a great study in the, anyway. And really the clinically significant difference happened at saturations below 90%, which is we will have referred them to hospital long before that. So it's probably not um, important or meaningful for our primary care patients, but just be aware that pulse oximeter alone, if, you have, uh, if, you, if you're worried about the clinical picture, otherwise, send them to hospital. Um, I'm just going to talk briefly about the EMR tool so you can see the kind of uh, approach we, we took to that and you can see them on the website too. And I know there's going to be work in New Zealand um, likely looking at something um, customised and local. But we used a slightly different way of monitoring in our PMS. Sorry, I said EMR. It's PMS in, in uh, New Zealand translation. Um, so we had hyperlinks to our pathways and all of these. So first of all, we would risk assess. And that would tell us immediately what monitoring frequency. And one thing I want to highlight about the monitoring frequency here is that COVID doesn't take the weekend off and so neither can we. And so it's really important to do those check-in calls in the weekend and not leave it to the patient and say, well, you know, we'll just tell them to call us if they're feeling worse. Because if a patient's ill and getting hypoxic, they're not in a good good space to be able to make those decisions of whether they should be calling someone or not. And they're also patients, um, like all of us, don't want to face the fact that they might be moving to that seriously ill phase of the illness. So it's very important to have a system for doing those check-in calls, even on the weekend days for those high-risk patients. And they only take five minutes. Once you've done your initial assessment, or thought the education, really it's just how are you today? How are your symptoms, better or worse? What are your vitals? Are they better or worse? Um, and that, that's a very quick consultation. Um, we uh, also record what you will be, which is when, when they were positive and therefore when the isolation period finishes. And all of these things can actually be done prior to your consultation. So you can spend the meat of the time on actually talking about the patient and how they are. Um, we also added a code to our disease registry so that if something comes up for these long COVID patients, we have the ability to see who our COVID patients were really easily and, and pull them up. Um, we, we also noted whether the patient had been contacted already by public health because as, in, as New Zealanders now, the contact tracing system can become quickly overwhelmed. And so often you'll be calling the patient before public health. And so public health gave us a script to read to patients if they hadn't yet been contacted about isolation and letting them know that public health would be in contact. And we also noted what equipment they already had at, at home and whether we were supplying them with a pulse oximeter. So anybody else in the team who was going to do a monitoring visit would see at a glance what they had. This is what our template looked like, and I'm hoping it's big enough for you to see. Um, and you can see here we've structured it so you can see the symptoms. Um, easily. Um, if, if they didn't have the symptom, then nothing else would appear. But if we clicked yes, they had the symptom, it would prompt us to say, were they better, worse or stable? And if they were worse, this would go red. So it, it flagged the things to watch, the things that seemed to be getting worse. And if we had two red boxes over two days, then we would really pay attention to that patient because they would appear to be deteriorating. We'd hover over them pretty carefully. Same with vitals. You can see at a glance, we could look down this column and see what, how their pulse, um, their sats were and whether they were deteriorating or not. Deteriorating or not. Other things that we have in is, is sort of routine prompts in our template, which just the other things that we all know, you know, as, as good GPs to pay attention to. Are there mental health issues with this patient that we need to support them with? Um, do they have access to food? Do they need extra caregiver support if they're a frail older adult while they're at home during this illness? illness, um, how's their financial health and health and housing. And the other thing that which really helped us to streamline things was we recorded what advice had been given to the patient from those domains so that we, we didn't need to repeat it. We knew that the first person who talked to them had already told them about the illness course and given them that kind of information. If we'd had a goals of care conversation with the patient, we also reported that. So that's really helpful in deciding whether for an older adult, especially if they're frail, whether 
What did we learn about the role of primary care? Um, we did, um, I can't ever take my researcher hat, uh, hat off, I, we did uh, monitor outcomes as part of QI. So we asked both patients and clinicians how it was for them. So in our own family health team, we had, we've had we monitored over 600 now um, uh, patients to date, um, and that's across 25 GPs. And at last count across Ontario, about 26 patients per provider have been monitored with pulse oxes. We found that clinicians were calm, confident and satisfied, and they felt it was core primary care business. The patients were very satisfied. They were so thrilled to be monitored by their regular care team, and they felt safe and secure. Um, we had better outcomes than the epidemiological data in terms of um, deaths and transfers to hospital. And we really, you know, looking back and making making sure that we looked at all the patients who did go to hospital, that, that they were all done in a timely way. There was no way that they could have been transferred or identified any earlier. And these were some of the comments of what GPs' experience in Canada was of using the SATs and monitoring their own patients for positive uh, for COVID positive illness. And in particular, how useful they felt um, they found those uh, um, set monitors in determining who needed to go to care and who they could actually keep away from clustered congregate settings and look after at home. So, so our other learnings, knowing a patient well is really potent asset during a, pa a pandemic. You know, the primary care is, this, is going to be the superpower of COVID care in New Zealand if an outbreak occurs on a wider scale. That equipping family doctors to leverage that relationship in a proactive way within a defined context was really powerful and it's scalable up and down. You could see that with the primary care model, we could look after over 4,000 new cases a day in Ontario. And if also, if you don't have many cases at all, you're also well equipped to deal with that, with, with that without having set up parallel new and different systems that we have to lead the primary care model from primary care in the way that we know works for our patients. And it's important to have clinical courage, even though it's an unfamiliar illness. It is familiar in many ways. It's mild to moderate effect, um, infectious disease. We know a lot about it now, and we know um, what happens and how to, when it happens and how to do it. And having one trusted source of information to rule them all is really important. Um, in this case, we could name the three advancing phases of intervention that, that we needed and what approach we would take if we reached um, those different um, stages of system um, overwhelm or, or taxation of the, of the hospital system. So primary care and mild to moderate COVID, um, the, my, my key message really is we've got this. It leverages the things that we know make primary care work. It's access, it's comprehensive care, continuity and per person-focused care. So um, I'd just like to, to focus a little bit before we get to the questions. I'm happy to take um, detailed questions about the illness itself, the trajectory and the care as well. Um, and you can also look at the detail on the website until the, the, um, the New Zealand uh, website carries that detail, which I know it will. But you can also look at the detail on the website as well, and that should answer a lot of those detailed clinical questions. But I've got a series of questions now to just consider and think about. Um, uh, in terms of what it would take for your practice or your region to be ready to provide primary care to mild to moderate um, early ill COVID patients. And I say mild to moderate, but, um, but it's really all COVID patients because early in the illness, um, all patients are relatively well. So it's only as the illness progresses through that first week that patients will kind of differentiate into whether they're going to be mild to moderate or whether they're going to be serious and need hospitalisation. So really primary care is involved pretty much at the outset of most COVID illness, um, as long as we're getting our testing and results done in, in a timely way at, at the outset. So access to pulse oximeters, I know that's being worked on and, and probably in the chat there's some um, asking and answering of those kinds of questions. But think about if you have access to pulse oximeters, how will you get them to patients in your practice or area? How will you clean them and keep the handling staff safe? So thinking about the the contamination issues with the pulse oxes. It's not the patients that you're protecting because they've already got COVID illness and so does the next patient. It's the people who are picking up and, and dropping off. And so we, um, you, you'll discuss it with public health and, and IPAC guidelines in New Zealand, but our public health um, staff advised us, and this is what we did, is we wiped all 
all the pulse oxes uh, were wiped down by staff and full PPE with a Lysol wipe, so high alcohol containing wipes. And then we stored them on the shelf in date order of their return so that they generally were on the shelf for 72 hours and public health assured us that was more than adequate to ensure that there was going to be no transfer um, of COVID to anyone handling those. Um, what systematic way will you identify and monitor those COVID positive patients? Because um, what I, the message I hope, hope you've got is that it's different from usual respiratory infection. Usually in respiratory illness, we wait for the patients to get sick enough that they feel they've got to come and see us. And that's too late in COVID illness because we really need them early on. So we've got their baseline. You know, We know what their baseline symptoms are. We know what their baseline sets are when they're relatively well. And so we can then really easily detect when they're dropping off. Um, so how will you connect with patients early in their illness trajectory? Um, do you have a clinical pathway, evidence supports and templates ready? Do you have an existing process that could be used for those quick check-in weekend monitoring calls? And how are you going to make sure that the patient who needs them um, gets to the list of that person who's doing those calls? And what processes do you have in place locally for those who might be in precarious social conditions, for example, access to food, people who are unable to self-isolate at or in their own homes. Um, and also to think about existing relationships. So these relationships we found that were the ones that were really valuable to us in providing good primary care to our patients. A close working relationship with our local public health um, group was, was really key. Um, making sure that we didn't duplicate our efforts and each, each group took the area of expertise. Good uh, working relationship with secondary care, that who you're going to call. So who you're going to call for general advice. For the patient who doesn't need, you know they don't need sending to hospital, but you'd really like to talk to someone a bit more about it because you're feeling a bit un uncertain, perhaps about their COVID or about some of their other um, comorbidities. Um, oxygen providers. So for a palliative stream patients, if you have, say, uh, one of our patients, we had a 90-year-old gentleman whose family and, and uh, he and his wife were clear he did not want to go to hospital, but he was getting hypoxic. His sets were 88 and he was starting to get confused and starting to fall and was difficult for his wife, who was of a similar age, to manage at home. So we were able, because we developed a, um, a, a communication and strategy with our local oxygen providers to get him oxygen within the hour, made a huge difference to his symptoms. And in fact, he survived his COVID illness. Um, and community care providers. So if people need extra in-home care, who is ready and prepared to be able to do that um, while protecting themselves? And who will be responsible in your practice for tracking or keeping a register of who's in that 14-day window for tracking your active patients? So that if you do have staff illness or staff have to be away because they have to isolate or quarantine, that, that nobody slips between the, the cracks. I'm going to stop now and answer um, any and, and um, probably not every, but any questions that you, you might have. So um, thank you, um, Nahmihi, uh, um, for, for paying attention. And I hope that some of this information might be useful to you as you start thinking about um, providing primary care that's as excellent as New Zealand's COVID response to um, keeping the, the illness out has been to date. Thank you very much, Dee. Uh, a bit like when I saw you present this at the college conference, that made me feel quite comfortable harm knowing there's a really sort of clear structure that we can use. So it looks as though we've already had some answer, the questions answered uh, by uh, some of our backroom uh, panellists. Thank you to those. We've got 23 open questions at the moment and there will be a question and answer um, report provided um, as part of the information that's going to be provided. So the most popular question is from Dave Cox, and it's the question that says, how does Canada deal with potential health inequities with its Indigenous populations? Any lessons for New Zealand there? So we um, we did pay special attention to First Nations populations. Um, we we had special uh, um, sort of webinars like this with those providers, trying to see if there were any more supports or different supports. We tended to supply more pulse oximeters to those um, groups, um, and we tried to work with their trusted health providers or. or um, uh, on reservations where they were, where they felt safe and secure. Um, the saturation issue that I mentioned, certainly in, in our experience in our family health team and with those providers, there didn't seem to be an effect of different skill, skin colour on um, oxygen saturations. In terms of um, equity in general, one of the equity enhancing um, structures and systems that was in place was that 
um, you know, those who are living in more um, deprived settings or overcrowded settings have a much reduced ability to be able to isolate that positive person within their house. And so for those mm. patients, there was the ability we had um, hotels a bit like MIQ, well, it's the same as MIQ really, where they could be um, they could be cared for and their family could um, remain um, at, at a distance because otherwise the whole household would have got, would have got COVID. We also, you'll notice on the website, we have though the patient um, information is translated into multiple, multiple different languages. Um, so that might be useful, um, though some of those other languages might be useful to you as well. I think that's clearly going to get, going to be important for us to yeah. have those those uh, those resources in different languages, definitely. The next question is, did your risk strategy table change with Delta COVID, i.e. young adults seeming to be more susceptible to the Delta strain? Yeah, that that's a really great question, and and certainly when um, Delta came, so our last week, our last wave, we had a substantial proportion of Delta. Previous to that, we had the B one one seven, which is the UK uh, variant, and we asked ourselves the question: Okay, is this a different illness? Do we need to do something different? And when we look, uh, my, one of my other hats was it on the modelling um, table as well, looking at who was being infected, and we were influenced really by the media reports because the media reports were full of emergency physicians and people saying it's affecting younger people more, people are sicker. But when we looked at it, um, what we were seeing was the epidemiological shift because of vaccination and those older age groups. So we weren't seeing those older adults purely because. Um, they were vaccinated and they weren't actually getting sick. So it wasn't that it was more com common in younger adults. It's just that it was more infectious. If we hadn't vaccinated the older patients, we would have been seeing them in huge numbers as well. And they did, we don't have data from Canada, but in the UK, they did look at the Delta variant to see if it was a more serious illness. And there was a suggestion that it might be slightly more serious, but the, the difference was so small that it, it, we decided it really didn't make any meaningful difference. And, and the key um, would was really that um, that thing that I tried to, to emphasise when we looked at the table, that your green stream, which is your younger adult, they're well, they're doing fine, they've got a bit of a sore throat, they've lost their sense of smell, you know, they're really feeling fine. If they start to get increasing symptoms, then they flip to that, that um, group. And so that's why having that initial consultation, and if they are going to self-monitor, um, to telling them that if they get increasing symptoms, they must contact you. And for some, um, it depended on how overwhelmed we were with work. And we were never overwhelmed with COVID work. It was usually our other work. Um, but we generally would check in with those younger adults, just do a single check in, call it a week, when at the time at which we know that the illness can tend to deteriorate. And if you look um, uh, back at the risk table, um, you, you will see that we've actually put some... Um, uh, some information there about the usual trajectory of the illness, and that is the, it's the same for for Delta. Delta, the main difference is just in its infections. As you can see, with what's happened with one case in New Zealand, it's just so infectious. But in patients who did eventually require hospitalisation with COVID, the median time from symptom onset, any symptoms at all, to developing dyspnea is about five days. And in patients who developed ARDS or, or severe COVID pneumonia, so they definitely need to be in hospital, the median time to onset of that was three days after they developed the dyspnea. So that gives you a, a Kind of a good idea um, when you're monitoring of of what that illness trajectory is. You know, the patient who started to get dyspnea, okay, and, and, a, and about three days later, I need to make sure that they're not getting substantially worse. The next question is sort of similar uh, along similar lines, but does the risk stratification change when the patients are double vaccinated? We don't know. Um, you know, we think we think that it will. Um, but we just don't know. We don't have an, enough data of illness. We've certainly we've certainly seen in our um, COVID positive patients and in, in our own cohort of patients who've been vaccinated, and they've tended to be picked up on cont contact tracing. So we have yet to see anyone with substantial COVID illness who's been fully vaccinated. We've certainly seen it in people who've been partially. So there's certainly no evidence to change that risk stratification in the partially vaccinated, and even uh, you know in the fully vaccinated, I'm loath to change it until we have solid evidence to say it's safe to leave those higher risk patients um, without without monitoring. So but I hope that we will. I hope that we will. <laughs> yeah. Obviously some interest in the pulse oximeter discussion. So the next question is there are El Cheapo pulse oximeters on Trade Me for about $20 each. I suspect the price has just gone up after this uh, webinar. Um, how do you know what's good enough? Okay, so the cheap ones are not. 
Um, so you pay for what you get with pulse oximeters. You don't need the ones that cost $200. Um, smartphones, not suitable for use. Um, there's various sort of smartphone apps and things. And we we found that the ones that were high enough quality were around about 50 Canadian dollars. I know the ministry are going to be looking at what they recommend as, as, um, as uh, suitable, robust pulse oximeters that will be around that range. So it, it'll be a watch this space thing. Um, and do, you know, when you're looking, if you're looking at them and looking at ones perhaps that you've got in your practice already, have a look and see if they're um, validated for use in both adults and older children. Some are for use in um, adults only, um, and some are for use uh, are suitable for use in adults and older children. There are none of, none of the adult ones that will do adults are also um, suitable for use in infants. So that's a different right. of fish. And just we do have some some information on the website about how to monitor children. It's much harder, as with any infectious disease, mm-hmm. it's much harder. And you use all those same kind of of things around respiratory distress. But we do have a nice presentation from a pediatrician there, a, a video that's, that's quite useful right. to watch. He's very practical. and I, I, I've had a quick look around the website and there's a huge amount of really good quality information there. So I just recommend people to click on that link and, and have a familiarise themselves with it, definitely. Yeah. Our next question is, how often did you need tests such as chest x-rays that required the patient to leave home? Um, pretty much never. Um, so the, there was a... a, a um, Initially, there was an enthusiasm for antibiotics, azithromycin, doxycycline, and others, both because people thought they might um, influence the COVID illness. Um, and then uh, there was a sort of sense of, well, we've got to protect from secondary bacterial infection. In fact, what we found in our cohort was that we only had two patients who developed a secondary bacterial pneumonia, um, and it was wow. barn door clinically obvious. It's the same as any viral illness. You know, they, they, they have those sort of symptoms that are clear COVID illness. And then they seem to be getting better, each of these patients. And this is only anecdotal, so but this is just to describe our experience. And um, that towards the end of the um, 14 days, um, all of a sudden they got worse again. And um, it, it was it was just clear that this was, you know, it's just like any, you know, any viral illness, and then they get a bacterial super infection, they they get the viral illness, they seem to be getting better, and then they get worse again. So it's that same kind of familiar pattern. And in those cases, um, we didn't send them to community facilities for chest X-ray, we just sent them to the emergency department because we found that in those cases they were starting to get symptomatic enough and dropping their sets enough that they were going to need hospital admission. And because it was out of the normal pattern, and so we didn't, you know, anything out of the normal pattern. Um, we at least they needed um, same day assessment and, and various tests in the emergency department. So we were hands off and in secondary care. Um, there's no, and, and I think it's really important to remember that this is a viral illness. So our approach to those sort of medicines are the same sort of choosing, choosing wisely approaches. And there's now there is now really good trial evidence that doxycycline and erythromycin and azithromycin and are actually not helpful. They don't improve outcomes. So we've got solid evidence now to go. It brings us quite nicely on to the next question about use of ivermectin. If there's no evidence for Oh, yes, staff. ivermectin. So ivermectin, very popular on social media. Um, and unfortunately, there, there are various trials that are promoted, um, again, on social media with forest plots and things, but the trials are of very poor quality. Um, and the and the outcome assessment is also often poor, and the and the data on outcomes. Is, I mean, I won't go into endless detail, but if you have a look on our website, you will see links uh, links to a really good meta-analysis that looks broadly at all the evidence. It was from the McMaster Evidence Review Group and also used by the WHO. Now, some in some developing countries, it did appear to be an effective ivermectin, which is weird, it's odd. But in fact, what's probably going on, and again, you'll see this on the website, um, in, in, and they were inpatients who'd been treated with a whole bucket full of drugs, including hydroxychloroquine, steroids, ivermectin. Um, and, um, what happens if you have strongyloides infection and you're given um, steroids, your risk of developing um, systemic strongyloides is very high. And the mortality rate from systemic strongyloides is extremely high. And so probably what you are seeing was the effect of ivermectin treating the, the diffuse strongyloides that the oral steroids were unmasking. So that's probably why. And we now have it in our pathway for hospitalised patients. There's no evidence ever for using oral steroids in primary care patients. So they should only be used in patients who are sick enough to need oxygen because the, the outcomes are actually worse if you trial, if you use them in mild to moderate patients. So it's not like COPD, it's different. So don't use oral steroids. But in our hospitalised patients, 
if um, we're starting them on oral steroids in the hospital setting and we screen them for epidemiological risk factors for strongyloides. And if they are at risk, then they're given ivermectin um, to guard against that systemic um, strongyloides. Thank you. Uh, so we talked a bit about pulse oximeters. What about thermometers? Do patients all need thermometers as well? Um, Yes, uh, it's if they've got them, that's fine. Um, but if they don't, think about will this change your management of anything? You know, if a patient if a patient has a fee, you know, if a patient it's not going to change your decision on when, whether to send them to hospital or not. And patients know whether they're feverish or not. Um, so it's it's helpful if they have one. And usually there are friends and family who can drop one around if they don't have one. Um, but but you know, don't don't kind of tie yourself in knots if you can't get a thermometer mm-hmm. for the patients. It's the same with blood pressure cuffs. Um, it re- really the the um, sort of work of breathing type indicators, the hypoxia, um, that kind of thing are the key things, and the pulse rate. And for the, from a SAT monitor, you'll get both an accurate pulse rate and accurate SATs. But if the patient's got a BP cuff, you know, it's useful to have that at home if they're used to home. And monitoring, right. but we didn't we didn't supply those if they didn't already. Right, that's that's mentioned in, in, in another question about is BP a value in assessment, thinking of the curb score in pneumonia. Yeah. So yes, if you had access to it, but it wasn't vital. Yeah. Yeah, and speaking of scores, so the CURB score and various other scores, the News Two score, various other scores have been tried trial to try and predict who's going to get more serious illness, but none of them really, including the CURB score, have really performed well enough for them to, for us to actually use them in clinical practice um, to be confident about decision-making. Right. Our next question is about the Delta strain. What are your thoughts on optimal time between first and second immunisations in that three to 12-week time frame? Yeah, interesting question. I mean, I don't want to override the advice of the of the public health specialists and, and um, Ashley Bloomfield, from which is the source of, of all knowledge and recommendations, but it does seem that... Um, it's a tricky situation, you know, and I'm thinking about it for my mother, actually, who has had her first dose but not her second dose and has her second mm-hmm. dose booked at three weeks. If this outbreak settles, then I would be re- recommending to her that she push it out a little bit more because that evidence from, you know, the trial, as you all know, and I know you'll know this because you're asking me the question, but the trial evidence was for that, you know, shorter time interval, mostly probably because they wanted to get the trial done as quickly as possible. But when they did a, 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 a real-world trial in uh, the UK because they didn't have enough supply. And we did the same in Canada, actually, because we decided strategically it was better to, better to get as many first doses as we could into people and get the second doses in when we could. So we extended that interval as well. And it seems as though the outcomes may be better with that longer interval. So if it's my mother, I'm plumping for six weeks. So it seems that <laughs> it seems that a little bit longer. Me personally, I had 12 weeks and was plumping for you know, I think that's a very good pragmatic answer, Dee. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, I'm sorry I don't have better data, but uh, but, but really, any second vaccine is better than no second vaccine. So. I think you may have answered a little bit about this in terms of, did you notice any difference between vaccinated and non-vaccinated? Do you, you talked about people being ill if they'd had sort of one vaccine rather than double vaccinated. Did you notice any other differences? Uh, no, not particularly. I mean, we still we still had patients who needed to go to ICU who had had one vaccine, so it pr- probably offers some some protection. But as we know, people can still get seriously ill, and they prob- probably probably well, they will, as we know, with double vaccine, they'll still a very small proportion of people may get serious illness still. But we didn't ever see any in our cohort, and we we're starting to see those positives through the just the contact tracing testing, um, and so that was quite reassuring. But that. That's anecdotal. So I'm sure there'll be larger population studies um, come out. The Israel data is around, but actually there's a lot of a lot of proclamations out of Israel, but nobody's actually seen the data. And we know right. that we know that Israel um, also has a very close relationship now. In order to to get first access to the Pfizer vaccine, they have a close data relationship with Pfizer now. And so I want to see the actual data. Um, uh, from that to, to around some booster doses and all those kinds of things. We've probably got time for one more question, uh, which is how long would you advise people to stay off work? What was your experience with that? Uh, I, it's like with any viral illness, it depends on how they feel. Now, it, it's, I can share with you a little bit about how long people are affected. So with we know with community-acquired pneumonia that many patients, the majority really, are still feeling not right by six weeks. They've still you know, got substantial um, sort of ongoing symptoms or effects, and it's the same with COVID illness. So, um, so really, um, judge it on on the patient. I mean, they obviously have to be 
um, if they're going back physical in person, they have to be out of their isolation period. Um, but really judge it on the degree of their symptoms. And if they're hypoxic, if they've been hypoxic, then they need to be able to go about their day-to-day activities and work without desetting. So that's really important. And that's a way we've used the SAP monitors for patients who have persisting symptoms to determine what level of activity makes them drop their sets and to make sure that they are stepped back from that. Because you find if they exercise and deset, they will be wiped out for the next day. So they need to we use it to calibrate their um, rehab exercises. So I think um, just just return to work gradually and see how the patient is and don't, um, you know, and, and sort of reassure them that if they've still got symptoms at, at six weeks, it doesn't mean they've got long COVID. We try not to use the label long yeah. COVID. It's a bit unhelpful, but that that's relatively normal. Even if they had a non COVID pneumonia, they, they would likely still be, you know, not feeling flash at, um, at six weeks. So that's, that's quite normal. And there's some data on symptoms also on the website about what proportion, about 10% of our primary care patients have um, sort of persisting symptoms, but most of those, it's a very small percentage by the time you get to um, three months. Great. Uh, thank you very much. That's p- perfectly timed. And our final question, we're now just turned eight o'clock. So I will say thank you to Professor D. Mangan for such a fantastic presentation and for probably calming us all down and making us realise that, yes, we have got this. I'd like to say thank you to Mobile Health for hosting us. Um, So thank you very much to everyone. And we can all give Dee a virtual round of applause, which I'm sure if everyone was unmuted would be deafening. Uh, But thank you very much for such a good presentation. Have a good evening, everyone. Lovely to see you all. It was a delight.